Good evening again. This is the first time I'm seeing this. Oh, okay. I'm holding it up. This is a uh, gopher, Singapore edition. So, gopher malayan. <laughs> and uh, the title of my talk, if I speak it quickly, oops, stay. Okay, never mind. Stay. You have to put it on your shoulder. It doesn't want to. Title of my talk, if you speak it quickly, is Gopher You. Yeah. That's a pun there. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All of us have limited mental capacity, limited mind budget. Um, some of us can keep more things in our mind, some of us can keep less things in our mind. But in, any, in all cases, it's limited. So what do you mean by mind budget? If you know how to drive a car, it's instinctive. Uh, you still know, you still need to know where you're going. So that consumes energy and mind budget. So the point I'm trying to ask is, what are your current skills? What do you currently do today? And what do you want to do tomorrow? So for example, if I currently write stuff for the web, typically web front ends, uh, I know JavaScript quite well, by definition. But I want to write back-end stuff. I want to write back-end servers. I want to write API servers. Mm, you're in luck. You're in luck. Because you can write back-end stuff in JavaScript. It's called Node.js. You still need to know about the rules of writing API servers. You still need to learn about that domain. But you don't have to learn a new language because learning new stuff consumes mind budget and it's difficult. Before coming to Go, I used to write in Java. So I know Java quite well. And I want to write web front ends. Well, you can write web front ends in Java. It's not impossible. But it's like using that to pull out nails. So the point I'm trying to say, the point I'm trying to make is you need to have the right tools. So what is Go good for? So a hammer is good for hammering in stuff. That kind of hammer is not good for pulling out nails. Go is good for writing cloud services, back-end servers. It's good for being, well, this is debatable, but those people who have written in Go think it's actually quite simple to read and understand. It's good for having this thing, funny thing called implicit interface satisfaction, which I'll talk about in a while. It's got fantastic concurrency. And my favorite feature, it's Java done right. It's cross-platform. So Go is somewhat familiar. That's the first line, hello world in Go. Uh, if you ignore the funny FMT and the capital case, it's not a class print line. It's just Go's way of uh, denoting a public variable. You see, it's pretty much the same across many, many different languages. So Go is somewhat familiar and therefore somewhat easy to learn. In fact, Go was designed to be easy to learn. Anybody who comes from a Java environment or a C-like language will find Go somewhat familiar. Go is definitely type safe. I like to, pro I like to pr uh, put up this example. Um, do you think this, com this program will run? Do you think this program will compile? Will it compile? won't even compile. Let's try. How many of you have run your presentations before? <laughs> I'm going to run the presentation. And let's read the error messages. Go error messages are not too bad, actually. So what it's done is taken this HTML, fed it into a temporary file, called compile0.go uh, and the compiler complained. Cannot use B type string 
in an integer for assignment. Can you do it in JavaScript? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Let's prove it. Uh, I need to put down the mic for a while. Uh. So I is definitely okay. Thank you. So I is definitely an integer. Now I is a string. JavaScript is bad, true or false? <laughs> I'm starting a flame war here. Actually, not true. JavaScript is a pretty good language. But we're in a Go talk, so let's talk about Go. <laughs> All right, this one is not so obvious. How strongly type safe is Go? Why, why type safety at all? But let's, let's look at this code and let's see whether it will compile at all. Uh, I declare a type called my num as an integer. And over here, I declare a variable i. It's of type my num and I assign it the value 2. Over here, I assign a variable j of type int integer of value 3. Can I assign i and j in Java? Can or not? Can. In Node.js, definitely can. In Go? No. Let's see the error message. Some of you already guessed the answer is no. Let's look at the error message. Cannot use type J, cannot use J, type integer, as type my num. So my num, even though it was derived from an integer, is a separate type in Go. So it is very, very, very strongly typed. And this is very useful if you write big code. If you write code that is shared with loads of programmers, it's also very useful for code you have written years ago. This is the equivalent of keeping everything in its right place and the right place for everything. But there's always two sides to a coin. Keeping everything in its right place takes a lot of time, a lot of bookkeeping. Node.js allows you to throw things all over the place, a teenager's bedroom. Node.js is like a teenager's bedroom. Uh, Go is like a well-kept, well-groomed house. So strong static typing allows you to catch most errors at compile time. And the runtime is quite predictable. In other words, after compiling and you deploy to production, you can expect predictable performance. But the flip side of it is if you are trying to throw, away, no, throw together a short script, a language like Node.js, Python, or Ruby is much more appropriate. So I guess the message is, what do you want to do? What do you already know? And what do you want to do in the future? So decide whether you want to learn Go. Let me try to convince you that Go is worth learning. So Go has implicitly satisfied interfaces. Those coming from Java know about Java interfaces. Um, Go tries to keep keeping your house in order, static typing, strong static typing, uh, more pleasant. So over here, I declare an interface type. It's called quantifier. And it's got one method in it called quantify. And quantify takes nothing and returns an integer. So over here, I declare another type, my str or my string. It's derived from type string. And it also has a quantify method. Now, how do I know that it's a method? This funny syntax, which Go created, uh, the way you read this line means quantify is a method of S of type my string, which returns an integer. That's how you read it. So basically, 
It's a method of my string. It says printf means print to the screen, quantifying s. And what's s? It's length of s. It returns the length of s as the, funny, as the final value. This is just a side effect, it's just to print out the string. Now I declare another type called my int, and it's derived from integer. And to quantify this integer, I determine whether it's positive, negative, or zero. That's simple code for that. So let's cut to the chase. Will this code work? Let's go through line by line. That's just a print statement. This line is interesting. Oh, by the way, Go has this funny reverse declaration syntax. So variable Q is of type quantifier. That's what it means. It's not quantifier, it's of type Q. It's the other way around. So variable Q is of type quantifier. So the quantifier has a quantify method. Q equals my int three. Now that's another funny Go, lang Go language syntax. All it's saying is take three and make it uh, my int. So I'm casting three to my int. Think of it like a constructor in Java. So that's a constructor kind of thing. Print Q quantify. So three is a numeric, it's positive, so it should be one, I guess so. Q equals my string ABC, and the length of ABC is three. So if we run this program, the first one should be one, the second one should be three. Mm, let's check it out. And true enough, it is one and three. Now, let me edit my presentation and rerun it. Anybody learn how to edit your presentation and rerun it? Let's change this to a minus four. That's editing my presentation. This is written in Go, by the way. <laughs> Real cool stuff. And let's run it again. So now it shows up as minus one. Can everybody at the back see the bottom rows? Good. Now, no surprise if I change it to zero. It should be zero. Let's run it. And it shows up as zero. If I change this to a four-letter word, a, B, a five-letter word, it just returns the length of the string. Now I'm going to show you goes C roots. Anybody know C here? Good. What do you think will happen here? Zero X twenty A C. That's a hexadecimal number. What do you think will happen here? Volunteers? Shout out your answer. Will it work? One character. Well, let's try it out. Quantifying Euro. 0x20ac is the Unicode for Euro, the Euro symbol. And the Euro symbol is a single character string. And it says 3, because the single character string is actually an integer, and it's of length 3. Really confusing stuff. But here are the things that will trip you up. It's C roots. All right. Why is this useful? Why are um, these kind of interfaces useful? Now let's say I have another type called exam paper. And uh, exam paper, you submitted it as suyin.doc. I shouldn't use Microsoft, I should use Google stuff. Anyway, that's the URL for my exam paper submission. And let's say exam paper is to grade me, quantify. How do you test this kind of stuff? It's difficult, right? It's got to make a service call, go out to the internet, grab the real exam paper and try to test it. Um, and that's not very predictable. The internet connection may be down, uh, I may have changed my exam, uh, my exam submission. But 
I can have fake exam paper to HTTPS does not matter dot .cwin dot doc. It never makes the internet call, but fake exam paper because it satisfies quantify, it works and it's great for testing. So this is how I use interfaces all the time. But this way of defining interfaces is very, very useful because in Java or similar languages, you must say this class implements this. And you may find that the implements may be implements A, B, C, D, E, F, G, until Z. It may be a very, very long string of implements. In Go, there is no implements keyword. It's implicit implementation. So long as it's got a quantify method, it works. The most fantastic example of this is I.O. Reader and I.O. Writer. You can print line to a database because it I.O. writes, I.O. reads. Okay, so that is the second reason why Go is such a good language. Um, if I'm losing any of you, if you want to ask any questions, just shout up, interrupt me. Yes. So Java has a, if you have a functional interface, yeah. Java 8 onwards has functional interfaces. Um, and the question is, if you use the functional interface of Java, you have this kind of capability, sort of, right? Um, and how is it different from the Java interface? Well, I like to think Go started it first, Java copied it. <laughs> <laughs> But here's, that, that's actually a very good question. Go, JavaScript, oh no, 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 sorry. Leave Go office. JavaScript, Node.js, uh, Java, Kotlin, all the new modern languages. If you hear one of the authors of Go speak, his name is Robert Pike, interesting speaker. He says, all these languages are becoming more and more alike. They're getting more and more features. Java is getting functional features. Um, Node.js is trying to get classes. So all these languages are converging. They're more or less the same language, perhaps with diff slightly different syntax. Go is different. Go is a very, very limited, I don't want to use this word, but it is quite relevant. Limited, stupid, basic language. It is designed so that anybody coming from a C-like language can look at it and sort of kind of understand it. It's designed so that you can write code that is efficient, that compiles quickly, and when you look at it five years later, you can still understand it. So Go is designed somewhat like Python was designed. Python was designed to be clear and easily readable. So many people have actually come from Python to Go. Why? Because Python is really slow. Global interpreter lock. I came to Go, not from Python, but from Ruby. Ruby is a fantastic language. It makes uh, developers like me who write in Ruby very happy. Uh, it's a very, very fun language. But, but, but yes, global interpreter lock. It's really slow. But that wasn't my issue. It was fast enough. Ruby was fast enough for me. But Ruby code, because it was so fun to write, when you look at it five years later, what am I trying to write here? Go tries to circumvent that problem. But anyway, let's go to Go's third feature, which I want to talk about, which is concurrency, which is something which, for a person new to programming, finds it really hard. And for a person who does JavaScript, finds it quite hard as well. So, over here I declare a function. It's called plus. And all it does, forever and forever, prints the plus sign. That's all it does. After one second, it prints another plus. 
forever and ever. Here we have basically the same routine, but it prints out a period, prints out a dot. Okay. Most of us, when we start out writing code, we write code like this. This, this won't compile. So let's run it like this. This won't compile at all. It's got some weird error message. About to execute select. So I'm about to execute select. Fatal. All Go routines are asleep. Deadlock. Which means there is something in Go called a Go routine. And it's detected a deadlock and it's crashed the program and it's exited it. So okay, let's make the program work. Let's fix me. Okay, let's run plus. Let's run this program. Okay, pluses are running. But my aim is to run plus and dot at the same time, concurrently. So as a beginner programmer, I will do that, of course. Do you think that will, that will work? No. Why? Sequential. Sequential execution. Plus, it's holding on to the CPU. It doesn't want to let go. Let's prove it. Yes. Plus, it's hogging the CPU. It doesn't want to let go. It doesn't let dot any time to run at all. Okay. I am the creator. I'm the writer of this program. Now dot can run, correct? Yeah, dot runs, but one go and plus and dot to run at the same time. How do I do that? Anybody? We've got Go experts here. Come on. Ah, yes, the Go keyword. What does the Go keyword do? Ah, start a Go routine. Let's do that. I added three characters, G, O, and a space. And I've turned a regular routine into a Go routine, into a routine that doesn't block. Let's prove it. Hey, it doesn't block, it works. But hold on, this part of the code is not executing. This part of the code which says, about to execute select is not executing. How do I get that to execute as well? Wow, you guys are learning fast. Put another make dot a go routine. So let's do that. Bang. Now, there's something interesting here. This comes from print line go concurrency. This comes from about to execute select, and then the pluses and dots. What has actually happened here is the program ran, put that into the background. It's running independently in the background. Put that in the background. That took a few hundred microseconds, fraction of a millisecond. So in a fraction of a millisecond or maybe a millisecond later, the print line executed. And I needed to put this select here. Select here, select is a statement which actually tries to determine which Go routine is ready to run. But if I remove that select, if I remove the wait forever, what do you think will happen? The program would actually... The program will terminate. What happened to my Go routines? So if the main thread actually, uh, main go routine If main terminates, the Go routines terminate. Let's prove that. So no more select, it's commented out. By the way, the double slash, if you've not figured it out, it's a comment. Program exited, no dots, no plus. So that's another feature of Go. It has garbage collected the Go routines. Go is a garbage collected language with a very, very, very performant 
garbage collector. Those people coming from Java, every now and then when the garbage collector collects garbage, it stops the world. The whole system stops. Go, garbage collector used to be like that as well. Stop the world for a few hundred milliseconds. The latest version of Go stops the world for a few hundred microseconds. So it doesn't really stop the world. All right. Those people who know JavaScript, who know Node.js, that's nothing new. Node.js has concurrency as well. So let's prove it. I'll put it here. F12 to get a console. So over here, I've defined two JavaScript functions, function plus and function dot. And this is very JavaScript. Every 1,000 milliseconds, lock to the console, a plus. Every 1,000 milliseconds, lock to the console, a minus, uh, not a minus, a dot. So when I run that, well, Pluses go on, two pluses, four pluses, five pluses, go on and on. If I run dot, if I can type, now you got plus and dots. So JavaScript can do what Go does. Mind budget. If you know JavaScript, do you want to learn Go? Okay, was it the same? Sort of, sort of the same. What I just did in my, in my web browser was I made use of a web worker, which will consume roughly equivalent to one Java thread, which is roughly equivalent to one operating system level thread. So if my computer has four cores, it can run four threads at the same time. At the same time. It can have many, many threads, but it can only run four of them at the same time. A Go routine is not like the JavaScript web worker. No. A Go routine, well, a million Go routines can share one thread. Somebody actually did a demo. A million Go routines share one thread. So it's a very simple, very lightweight Go routine. Almost does nothing. But still, a million Go routines can share one thread. And on a four-core machine, you get four million Go routines. So the next point I'm trying to make is... So one Java thread is not equivalent to one OS thread. After Java... Ah. After Java 8, guess, guess who they copied? Guess who they copied? <laughs> they copied Go. The ideas are very old. The ideas are very, very old. Right? Go routine is actually not the correct word to use. It's correct in Go, but it came from a paper called uh, concurrently, co Concurrent Sequential Processes. It's called Core Routines, spelled with a C. Um, nobody paid attention to core routines except for Erlang for a long, long time. Right? Then Go came out and said, core routines are cool and I'm going to brand them Go routines. And then everybody started saying, hmm, Kotlin wants it as well, Java wants it as well. So all these languages are becoming more or less the same language with different syntax. They're getting new features. They're getting features. <laughs> Um, before coming to Go, you already, as you already know, I programmed in Java. And I was looking for better Java. So I thought Scala is good. Yucks! Scala is good. 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 Scala is good
that's horrible. <laughs> Scala is an extremely powerful language, don't get me wrong. It can do everything. You can write DSLs, domain-specific languages in Java. It is so big that I can't read my code after one week. I can be so undisciplined that I cannot read my own code after one week. That is Scala. Anyway, how good is Go's concurrency? That's, that's another thing I want to highlight about Go. Is Go's concurrency good? Go is designed, the birthplace of Go was actually Google. We are at its birthplace, the organization, not here, but the organization. And Go was invented, the story goes, when they were trying to compile a big C++ program. That big C++ program took about 40 minutes to compile. They compiled the equivalent program in Go and it took less than a minute, a few seconds. But compile time is one thing. How performant is it? This is a whole web browser in Go. Now, those people working in Node.js, they say, I can have Express and I can write a similarly short web browser in three lines or four lines or two lines. That's besides the point. The point is, can Node.js perform on my really crappy laptop 11,000 requests per second with almost no optimization? Well, Go optimization. Compared with Nginx, same laptop, running a static website, all it does is serve hello world. It came out with about the same, 10,000 requests per second, 11,000 requests per second, it's within the error bands. Right? What I'm trying to say here is, for a beginner who knows nothing about OS tuning, who knows nothing about concurrency, he can write code that's production ready as good as Nginx. So Go is designed for heavy-duty back-end servers, production-ready back-end servers. Really good, really performant, easy to read, easy to extend back-end servers. And my favorite feature of all, Java done right. If you use pure Go, in other words, you don't link against a C library. You can link Go against a C library. That's called C Go. If you don't use C Go or use Windows specific DLLs or Mac specific libraries, you can all you need to do to cross compile, turn off C Go. C Go enable equals zero. Turn off C Go. Specify the operating system, Windows. I've got clients that insist on using Windows. What to do? Not only Windows, old Windows, 386 Windows, not x64. Go build Hello World, it generates an exe file, a Windows 386 exe file. Let's look at the complete list. AIX, wow. Android, Darwin, what's Dragonfly? Don't know what Dragonfly is. FreeBSD, some funny OS called Illumos. I don't know about it. Ah, this is really, really, really interesting. JavaScript, WASM, WebAssembly. Yes! Go can compile to JavaScript. WebAssembly uh, binaries. And these people are using it because they want to play games on the web browser. And Go is so performant, they put a whole game engine in the WebAssembly with, with physics and everything in there. Nice target. But for Go, it's just another target. It targets all these platforms. My platform happens to be Linux, AMD64. Right. So, let's go back to the presentation. If you want 
the code download, the whole presentation download, it's there. Still in GitHub. Lots of other presentations there as well, but this one is there. And you can run your presentation like I ran my presentation. Thanks for listening. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, comments, flame wars, yes. So, uh, does Go able to handle like, like machine learning package for that? Yeah. Okay, uh, the question was, usually machine learning folks use something like Python. And Python is a fantastic language for machine learning because Python was written by Udo von Rossum. I'm pronouncing that name all wrong. He's a mathematics professor. So before TensorFlow came out, you had NumPy, and Python was an absolutely great language in that area. <coughs> Go is not. It's not a machine language, optimized language. It's the wrong tool to use uh, Go for machine language. But Go is very, very good for data engineering. Before you can do machine learning, you need to get your data in shape. You need to clean your data. So Go has uh, data flow uh, libraries, which can clean up massive amounts of data really quickly, but not the actual machine learning itself. Any other questions, comments, reactions? Do you like Go? Is it worth learning? Yes, OK. My friend here has a difficult question for me. He promised me a difficult question. Is it on? Doesn't matter, I'll repeat your question. Okay, you can try. Oh, it's working. Yes, it's working. Um, yeah, it's a weird question, maybe. And I don't know if it actually fits in here, but I will pose it anyway. Um, so when you compile Go, you get a static binary, mm -hmm. which can go big pretty fast. Very big. So that's why actually people like to put it into Docker containers because you can use a very small container to run the self-contained Go binary. Okay, but I think you just confused half the audience. Very big binary, but very small Docker container. Okay, continue. Very, I mean, you use a basic Alpine container with a few uh, megabytes of stuff in there and then you can run your Go binary. If you assume that you have for instance, one physical machine that for some reason runs like a thousand containers running the same Go binary. It's called Kubernetes, yes. Yeah. Um, and let's say for some reason the Go binary that needs to be loaded is like 60 megabytes. Well, this is a big Go binary. Right? Is there, to your knowledge, any optimization in using the memory from the side of the Linux kernel. I, I think I have read that it does this with normal C binaries using common libraries that you just have one copy in your in your memory, but all the instances running use kind of the same copy. Okay. Does that happen in with Go binaries too? Or I guess I guess you can summarize the question oh, is in summarize, summarize the question is can you share bind can you share memory? Effectively, um, if you've got 60 instances of the same thing, can you share memory? Well, does sort it of, use kind the of. Same binary code from the memory, or does it use 60 or 1,000 copies of it, which eats up a lot of memory? It will eat up, it will be 60 times the memory. Okay. Okay, um, first of all, let's answer. Actually, this is a very, very good question. Uh, let, me attack, uh, let me attack the first question first. Let me address the first question first. Go binaries can get pretty big, pretty fast. That hello world was about one to two megabytes. Why is it so big? Why is a hello world almost two megabytes? Yes. When you write a Java class, a hello world in Java class, and the class file is a few hundred bytes. A Go executable is a few megabytes, almost two megabytes. But the Java file can't run on its own. 
you need the JVM, which is 50 megabytes or more, the last time I checked. The entire JVM for Go, the entire Go runtime is embedded in the binary. The entire Go runtime that handles Go routines, the entire Go runtime that does all these smart implicit interfaces, the entire Go runtime that does strong static types is embedded in that one or two megabytes in that hello world. So most Go binaries are self-contained, most. Net HTTP is not self-contained, but you can make it self-contained and you can make it a pure Go thing. Net HTTP or the Net library actually makes use of the operating system's resolver library, which means it's a dynamically linked library and many pure Go purists don't like it. So they turn off CGO and you can produce a pure Go binary. And that consumes maybe about five megabytes to eight megabytes. The entire web browser resolver stack. So that's why Go binaries can get big quite fast. The entire Docker binary was written in Go and it's about 50 megabytes, I think. Right? So really, really huge projects like Docker, Kubernetes, Kube Control, Kube CTL, they weigh in roughly tens of megabytes. Um, when you deploy a Go binary in a Docker container, I don't use Alpine because um, I, just, I just use from scratch. In Docker terms, from scratch means start with an empty container, empty Docker container. And if my Go binary is five megabytes, my Docker container is five megabytes. Really tiny Docker containers. So the mantra for Go is don't communicate by sharing memory. Right? Don't communicate by sharing memory. Share memory by communicating. So everything in Go is independent and unshared, non-shared. Right? You communicate across different processes using channels. Any other comments, questions, reactions? If not, I think Xiao Xiong. Uh, yes. So you have used Apache Benchmark to test that Hello World. Right? Yes, I've used Apache Benchmark to test the web browser Hello World. So that is pure static content, which is getting solved. So it could perform better. So is Go right fit to use IO intensive, uh, intensive task? Because if I'm using Golang as a to build up my backend system, then I'll have to perform right to business logic and that could have the IO intensive. Okay, let me repeat the question for the audience. The question was, is Go, now because that hello world was static content, uh, static web browsers, everybody knows it's blazingly fast, right? Any, any person can write a fast static web browser. The question was, is Go the right tool for IO intensive dynamic content? And absolutely, that's the purpose of Go. It's designed to have very, very fast uh, IO intensive stuff. If, ev if everything is compute intensive, like video encoding, Go will not be very effective because the compute or CPU resource hungry process will grab the CPU. But if it is IO intensive, Go is the perfect fit. Much, much, much better than Node.js. Node.js rocked the world because it multiplex a lot of IO intensive process onto one thread. Go multiplex the same thing actually go sort of copy Node.js in that sense, but not, not on one thread, on all available threads. If you have a 64-core CPU, 64 processes can be called to task versus one process in Node.js. Any other? Yes? Last question. Last question. Okay. Tekchun says other speakers need a chance as well. Uh, apart from this uh, highly static type and all those, so what's the goal, uh, main objective trying to solve the problem? What problems is trying to solve? The first question. Second question is, uh, is it effective when we have a limited CPU or limited memory area other than the Java and all those things? Okay. Uh,
writing back-end service, full stop. Go is fantastic for writing back-end service. Second question, is Go resource hungry? Does Go require a lot of resources like Java, for example? And the answer is no. Go is very, very efficient, next to C in terms of efficiency. If C was the Go standard as one, it uses 100%, Go would use maybe about 110%, maybe 105%. So it is very, very resource efficient. Thank you.